The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Hello everyone, welcome to Introduction to MySQL Replication. In this session I'll talk a lot about MySQL Replication, uh, what it is, why you would use it, a little bit about the details, but again this is an introduction. How many people use MySQL now? Yeah, a few? How about Replication? How about people who want to use Replication but don't know what it is? Ah, there you go. That's a, this session is for you. So. Okay. A uh, standard uh, disclaimer, everything I'm about to talk about may or may not be true. Uh, check out the Oracle online to verify before you use it. My name is Chuck Bell. I am the MySQL Utilities Team Lead. I've been working with MySQL for over eight years now. Uh, in a variety of things, backup, connectors, replication, utilities, uh, I can go on and on. Uh, about it. Uh, some of my interests are cloud computing, replication, and so on and so forth. And there's a couple of books you might want to check out. Uh, today we're going to talk about, again, terminology, basic things about MySQL replication, uh, the repli using replication for scale out, in other words, to scale out your reads, to allow your application to read more data more quickly. And a little bit about high availability. I actually did a, a high availability session uh, two sessions ago, uh, but I, some of those slides are in here because I think it is pertinent to replication, because replication is a huge part of high availability. And then I'll talk about the binary log. I won't go into too much detail there because I want to talk about MySQL utilities a little bit. And utilities are designed, among many things, to make replication easier to manage. So, what is this? This is my SQL replication. By the end of this session, you'll be able to understand that drawing. So, some terminology. Uh, MySQL, why would you use MySQL replication? Well, first and foremost, we're looking at high availability. Uh, if you use the latest version of MySQL 5.6, which is actually a developer milestone release, and think of it as a beta. It's available for download for you to evaluate. MySQL 5.6 has a lot of advanced features, particularly having to do with replication. And I'll talk a little bit about those when I talk about the failover utility. Uh, scale out is the primary reason you would use MySQL replication, and I'll go into that a little bit. So you spread your read queries out over many servers. Uh, Off-site processing, perhaps, you want to create a replicant a copy of your database for use somewhere else, maybe in a developer form, maybe in an engineering form, something like that, that needs a copy of the live data, but you don't actually want anything that they do to affect your live data. That's one way. Uh, maybe for reporting, so maybe you want to do some offline uh, uh, reports or something to do kind of data warehousing kind of thing. Lastly, uh, MySQL replication is also a disaster recovery tool. Because it makes a replicant, a copy of all your databases, it's a great way to keep a backup. In fact, there's a strategy I'll show you of taking, uh, setting up replication for the sole purposes of creating a backup. It allows you to do an online backup, which is really cool because typically you'd need a special tool for that. Now, how you would do this, uh, snapshots is one way of doing that, uh, disaster recovery either making a backup or using the binary log to record changes that have happened. These are the, the individual changes, inserts, up, deletes, deletes, that kind of thing. Or MySQL dumps to create just a raw SQL version of your uh, data. Or I should add to the slide MySQL DB export is one of the utilities which will allow you to export in SQL statements like MySQL dump or comma separated values, tabbed files, uh, and, and uh, even grid format if you want to be able to look at the data in a grid offline. Binary log, as I mentioned, it is used for replication, but its primary purpose is to record changes. So when you think of the binary log is replication and replication is binary log, well, that's not necessarily true. 
Replication includes the binary log, but you can use the binary log without using replication. Because the binary log, again, just records those changes, the changes to the actual rows. So if you think about that, in, in the backup sense, you want to take a backup of your data. You could do that, say, at midnight, between midnight and 5 a.m. when there's no users on your system. Maybe you already have that policy in place. But what do you do about the changes that happen during the day? So what happens if, it, if uh, as someone mentioned earlier, someone does a delete from without a where clause, and they have the permission to do so on one of your tables? The data is gone, but bye All the changes for the entire day are gone because you did your backup at midnight the night before. If you had binary logging turned on, you would record all those events, including the delete. So then you could restore your data, replay the binary log up into and before, or skip, that delete, and now your data's back. Up to the minute. We call it point in time recovery. So here's just a sampling of some of our customers. You might recognize a few of these logos. Anybody from one of these logos? That's always an interesting question. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> then I can talk about them. <laughs> okay, terminology. We call the originator, the source of a, of a replication pair. Replication is between two servers. Now it turns out you can do many of one kind of server. So replication is from one server to one or more other servers. That originating server, or the source, we call the master. And that's where your changes are recorded in the binary log. Those recipients, the destination, we call the slaves. And you can have, again, one or more. What they do is retrieve the events from the master via the binary log and replay them on the slave. So they execute the events after they've happened on the master. So there's an interesting point here. You would only do your writes on the master. You would not do writes on the slaves. So you do it on a slave, no other slave would know about that right. So you send the rights to the master. Those are complicated operations, typically take longer. So your master is typically a more powerful system. And then you can use less powerful systems for slaves, which only do reads. And so you can have more than one slave. You can divide your application over many slaves and therefore get much faster throughput for reads. We call that read scale out. So the binary log holds their change for everything that happens on your master. It is split, if you use a transactional storage engine, it's split into transactions. So we'll actually only execute on the slave transactions as a whole. So if something happens on the master during a, during a long-running transaction and something bad happens there, goes wonky, you can be sure that that's not going to happen on the slave. The slave is only going to execute transactions that complete on the master. There are a couple kinds of replication. The default kind of replication in MySQL 5.5, 5.1, and so on is asynchronous replication. And that's where transactions are committed immediately. So as soon as the transaction commit happens, it's actually written and then it's read by the slaves and executed. Uh, it, it is faster, but it's, it is vulnerable to server crashes. So if something happens, you know, uh, the event gets uh, the transaction gets executed on the master, the event is recorded in a binary log, gets sent to the slave, but something happens to it on the way, the slave doesn't know anything about it anymore. So it's kind of lost, that transaction. That, that's one of the problems with asynchronous uh, replication. So some of our customers helped us through their own idea, and this is an excellent example of how the community has given back to MySQL, or I should say Oracle, is semi-synchronous replication. It's asynchronous replication with the ability to acknowledge, to send an act back to the master to say, hey, this has actually been received by a number of slaves, and therefore it commits a transaction once it's a certain, that threshold is reached. So that's called semi-synchronous. There is another form, as you might imagine, synchronous replication, where the transactions are not committed until everybody in the topology, that was the set, of master and slaves is aware of it and have at least two replicas. Now this is provided in a product called MySQL Cluster. So if you need synchronous replications where you've got to make sure that whatever happens, 
gets replicated everywhere, and at no point is there any possibility of having a stale read or a lost read, then you're going to look at our MySQL cluster replication. So uh, keep, that, keep that in mind. But I'm going to be talking about asynchronous replication for this talk. So what happens here? This is a, a drawing of the, a simplified drawing of the architecture. These boxes along the top row there, it says session, dump, IO, and SQL. You can think of those as threads because they actually are threads inside the server. And this shows two servers, a master and a slave. So on a master, these session threads are your connections, say from an application or someone running the MySQL client tool. Uh, uh, trivia question, what was the MySQL client tool called before we started calling it the MySQL client tool? It's called the MySQL monitor. Well, there's a $10 answer. Uh, so once you use the MySQL uh, client or an application to write data to the master, it is recorded in its binary log. And then there's another thread called the dump thread, and there's one dump thread for each slave that's connected. So when a slave connects to a master, a dump thread is started for it, and the slave will request entries from the master's binary log. And it does that in MySQL 5.5 and before by specifying the name of the binary log and the position. Okay, so when you connect a slave to a master, you will provide it the, the log name and position of the master where you want it to start. And you will get that on the master by executing show master status. On the slave, it has, every slave has two threads. An IO thread, which is responsible for requesting the events from the master via the master's dump thread, and an SQL thread, which is responsible for executing it. And the way it works is this. The master, a write occurs on the master. The session thread writes it to the binary log. The dump thread then reads it from the binary log, sends it across the wire to the slave, which is received by the IO thread, which then writes it into yet another log called the relay log, which is the same format as the binary log because it's the same data. And then the SQL thread on the slave executes that event. So there is a loop here where you can see how things go through. So if something goes wrong at any one of these steps, once you have knowledge of where, how the process works, then you know where the problem could be. For example, if you issue show slave status and you see the IO thread is down or has an error, you automatically know that you can't get any more events from the master. Okay. Similarly, if the SQL thread is down, but the IO thread is up, you know you're accumulating events in the relay log, because that's independent of the SQL thread, but you also know that they aren't executing. And also in show slave status is the position of the relay log where the SQL thread last read. So all that diagnostic information, a lot of people think it's a mystery, you know, it is some sort of art, it's not. It's all, the, all that information is there for you. You just have to understand the path. I know that's a lot to come at you at one time, but I want to plant that seed so when you work with replication and you look at, oh, sleeve sleeve stage and you see relay, relay log position. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, that simply means that's the last position that the SQL thread read from that particular relay log. So let's look at this a little bit more. IO thread and SQL thread, only two threads on the slate. What do you think happens when you have a lot of writes coming to the master, like 10,000 in, in a few seconds? Well, that could be from 10,000 connections on the master, theoretically. That could happen instantaneously. It's going to happen one at a time on the slave. And we have an answer to this. It's called a multi-threaded slave. And that's part of our MySQL 5.6 enhancement package. And you can get that off of the DMR if you go out there and look at that. That's actually part of the DMR, multi-threaded slave. And what that does, in short, is divide up the uh, events by database. So it parallels the, the, the IO and the SQL execution based on database. That's pretty neat. There is a good improvement that way. OK, uh, binary logs. Binary logs are named a little strange. They are named whatever name that you tell it 
because there's, there's a way to tell the, the binary null name, but by default it's called mysql-bin. And the file extension for you Windows folks is uh, a numeric. It's uh, six positions and starts at zero or whatever position you tell it to start at. And it increments as it creates a new binary log. Now there are several events that can cause the master to create a new log. Flush binary logs is one. You know, flush tables with, with, with read log. Yeah? All those event kinds of things will cause the master to create a new log. Now why would you want to do that? Well, if you periodically rotate, it's called rotating the logs, then you can take those logs off the master somewhere and store them safe place, like with your backups. And that way, you, if you need to go back, something t terrible happened three weeks ago for a particular table, you can go back and rebuild or rerun that scenario and recover that event and find out what happened if you store them, the old binary logs, along with your backups. So the takeaway here for backup and recovery is use the binary log as your daily, perhaps, incremental backup. That's essentially what you're getting. Now, in, in the case of a binary log, there's also a second file called index. The index contains the name in, of the, the most recent binary log. So you have a lot of log files over time. You don't necessarily know which one it is, particularly if you have a, a habit, and some people do, of renaming the logs. So they stop the server and restart it again with a new name. They might want to do that for various reasons. In which case, you may not know which one is the latest one. But you can look at the, the MySQL bin.index file and find out. The binary log contains those log events. It, it is not readable by humans. <laughs> but fortunately, we have a client tool called MySQL bin log, which will allow you to dump the contents of the bin log, search the bin log for different things. And depending on what you're looking for and what kind of replication you've used, and I'll get into that in a moment, some of it may actually be readable. So you, it is possible in what's called statement-based replication to actually see the SQL that executed. But if you use row-based replication, you would only see you know, binary data. Something interesting about the binary log, if you do an extract of the MySQL bin log or an entire binary log and you open the MySQL client, you can actually copy the events from the binary log and play them to the MySQL client. So this is one way of replaying your binary logs. To coordinate positions of logs, I mentioned the log, binary log name and position. Position is simply the offset from the start of the file of where that event is. And since events have different sizes, that number could be different from time to time. It's not necessarily always going to be, say, 106, for example, for starting. It could be different depending on the event that happened. Okay, let's switch to a little bit more about basic replication. A basic replication, when you have, again, one master, one slave, you might want to use it in this scenario for offloading processing on the master. Simply want to split your reads and writes. The writes go to the master, reads go to the slave. You may want to create a master and a single slave in order to do backups. So if you have the need to never lock any tables ever for more than a few milliseconds, so you have something that's truly online, how in the world do you ever take that down to do a backup? Here's how. Use replication, replicate to a slave. At the appropriate time, you issue a lock tables on the slave. Do your backup record its relay logs, start the slave. Now you've done a backup online, and you've never stopped the master or interrupted your apps, ever. So that's one reason you might want to use replication. Um, we have a, a tool called MySQL Enterprise Backup. It's part of our paid uh, application suite. So if you buy our uh, services, you get that as part of the package. MySQL Backup also has a non-blocking uh, backup that you could use. Uh, yes, sir? If you're using NMDB storage, you don't have to lock tables anyway, do you? Well, sure you would. Why would you want to? Oh, oh you, you mean a um, consistent read. You would lock it with a consistent read. So you issue start a consistent read, yes. So if you're purely NODB tables 
and you're only ever using EWB. In other words, the emphasis is on InnoDB. <laughs> and yes, you can. But if you throw any other table in the mix, any other storage engine, then yeah, you've got to do some locking. Yeah. Um, OK, so MySQL Enterprise Backup is, is a very interesting tool. It works with InnoDB for online backup. It also works with my ISAM, but it's not truly online. It's not truly hot backup for my ISAM. So how would you add a slave? So you've got one master and one slave, but you want to add another one. Well, you've got to find out where the master is currently, right? So you would bootstrap the slave. You would have to restore your latest backup from your master. And that latest backup would have what included? When you do a backup, you also record the current master's binary log and position. So when you provision a slave, that's what's called provisioning a slave, you restore that backup, you know the master's binary log file and its position, you issue the command change master to, and part of the criteria is the master's binary log and its position, you start the slave, slave will request from the master that binary log and position and start reading events from then on. So the master does not have to be stopped to use it. Master can continue to continue receiving rights. There's a tool to make this a little easier. It's part of the MySQL utilities. It's called MySQL Replicate. And you can see a tiny example, but I apologize for font size, right there, where you see MySQL Replicate. We tell it the REPL user uh, and its password. The, the colon there separates the username and password. We tell it the master. We tell it the slave. And it goes off and does everything for you. And there are different ways that you can tell it to connect to the master. You can tell it to connect at a particular binary log and position, so tell it specific position. You can tell it the start replication from the very start. In other words, it re requests all the events from the master. So that could be, you know, time consuming. <laughs> or you can tell it to start from the current position. So if you have a, the luxury of being able to stop your master, you could stop the master provision your slave, and just tell MySQL Replicate to start from the current, and then you start everything back up again. Here's another one, uh, standby master. So let's say you have uh, a master and a slave, or maybe one or more slaves, but you want to make sure that you have a backup, a live backup, in case the master goes down. Well, that standby is actually a special form of slave. It's, it is a slave, but it's a slave that doesn't have any activity on it. It is connected to the master as a slave. It's getting all the, the events. It's replaying them. Everything's cool. But it allows you to isolate a particular slave for the purposes of switching the role from the old master to the standby. And the way you would do this is very important. That fourth bullet there, log slave updates. When an event is read from the master, via the I.O. thread and recorded in a, re a relay log, it is not recorded on, in that slave's binary log. If you want to use a standby master, the difference between a, a normal slave and a standby master is log slave updates. What that means is when it reads an event from the master and writes it to its relay log, the SQL thread reads it, executes it, and then writes it to its binary log. Why do you need that? You need that because if that master role needs to change to the standby, you need to connect the slave to the new master. Slave needs to read events from the new master's binary log. If you don't use log slave updates, you can't use that slave as a new master. Is there a reason that it doesn't do that by default? Yeah, typically don't, slaves are designed to be read-only slaves. So there's no reason to have a binary log. But in special situations like this and other more complex topologies, you would definitely turn it on. In fact, most people who, who have advanced replication topologies will turn it on by default. And indeed, in MySQL 5.6, where we use global transaction identifiers, it's required. And you, I'll, if I don't explain why, hit me again when I come back to that slide. Uh, so for synchronizing your switchover, uh, there are several commands you want to be able to use. Show master status to find out where the current master is. Start slave until tells this slave to start and execute events until a certain point. 
master position weight tells it to execute to that certain position and wait. So you can find out more about these commands in the, the online reference manual. So replication for scale out. In this case, I've been talking about writes to the master, reads to the slave, many slaves, great throughput. Well, here's an example. You would have a client, writes only to the master, and it could read from one or more slaves. So you could potentially distribute your read query processing over many different slaves. You write, still go to the master, but your clients need to send simply the read queries to the slave and writes to the, to the master. But how do you know which slave to read from? Mm. Well, you could do some sort of load balancing. Let's say you have a client that is writing to the master, but you don't know necessarily which slave to read from. But maybe you've created a application that's going to do load balancing. Maybe it's executing a round robin algorithm, something like that, or simply rotating its group, its reads. Or you've done some sort of more sophisticated type of thing. But the point is that you can do load balancing across your slaves. You could perhaps even write an application that monitors the performance of the slaves and reads from the slave that is least busy. That would be handy. So how does the client know where? Well, you could use an intermediate proxy, an actual load balancer. The advantage is it's transparent to the client. Client only collects to one particular server. So that load balancer takes care of the sending the rights to the master and reading from various slaves. Disadvantage is the query analysis will add processing time, add delay, as well as the fact that it's necessarily, because it can't be exhaustive or else it would delay everything, it's sometimes imperfect. And the application can't provide any hints to it in order to tell it how to do, you know, where to go from there. On the other hand, if you write your own load balancing, since you're writing your application, you know it intimately well, you also know the access patterns of your, of your users. In other words, what databases and tables they access the most, for example. You can write it to provide those kind of hints directly to the application. In other words, the application can know if I want to read a particular article or a particular table and have to do some sort of range query, then another user does a similar range query, you might not want to run those queries on the same slave. You know, they might delay each other because they're potentially uh, query processing heavy. You could send them out to other where. Uh, but the disadvantage, of course, is you've got to write all that stuff. <laughs> but the good news is you can. Uh, the replication topology, there's nothing there stopping you from doing that. So when you talk about distributing queries, there's some caveats. Of course, read, write, split, drill that into everybody's head. Uh, the session stickiness, this is interesting. If you decide to do your own load balancing for reads, you should stick your reads to a particular slate. Why is that important? Two words, query cache. If you rotated your query, the same query over every slave, every slave has to recache potentially that query. If you do that enough times, the cache becomes emptied and then you gotta do it all over again. So if you have a repeating query, aha, there's a hint. You could send it all to one slave and it would be potentially faster than sending it to any one slave. Again, there's some algorithms you might want to consider around Robin, random even, <laughs> hashed perhaps by IP address, or of course, least number of connections, as I mentioned, the least busy slave, fastest response time, that kind of thing. All of this is application level stuff that you can do. Let's talk about another one. A relay slave. A relay slave is a slave in the middle that is both a master and a slave. That's why we call it a relay slave. It is a slave to the original master, but it's also a master to all the slaves. What it does is allow you to reduce the load on the master so that it can concentrate on the writes. And then you store the binary log on the relay. So it's the similar thing by the standby. You want to log slave updates on your relay log. You can do it uh, for another reason, and this is most popular. You might want to only uh, replicate certain databases. So rather than filter at the master, which you could do, but it's not recommended, 
So you filter at the master, then the only copy is ever on the master. But if you filter on this side of the relay slave, now you have a copy of all your databases on the relay slave. So it could still be, be there for redundancy and backup purposes, but you only replicate certain things. So you filter at the relay slave. It's very nice. And we have some tools, again, the MySQL Enterprise Monitor and MySQL Proxy allow you to do that thing. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, take a look at some of those products. The way it does this is interesting. There is a storage engine called the Black Hole Storage Engine. It's called the Black Hole Storage Engine because anything that's written to it gets deleted. It stores absolutely no data. That's useful because on, in this scenario, when you use the relay slave, Again, it requires the event from the master via the master's dump thread. It writes it to its relay thread, or relay, relay log. The SQL thread reads it from the relay log and executes it. It executes it in the black hole engine, which means it doesn't store anything at all. Did you lose anything? Uh -uh. It's in the relay log. That means that that relay slave doesn't have to have much disk space. Only has to have a disk space for the size of the relay log that you want to store. Very interesting. You might want to have specialist slaves. You might have several applications running. You might want to do a message board on one, maybe some sort of application that monitors friends on another. In which case, you could tell the friends application to only look at certain slaves, and message board look at others. And if you're getting ahead of me, that also means you can use filtering to filter the database associated with one app to some sets some subset of slaves and replicate, filter the others to the other. So it's scale out dependent on the role. You can only store those tables that are needed through filtering. Um, and you, it, it do, reduces the write load. I don't necessarily agree with that. But it can reduce the write load in certain situations. Uh, but it does filter out, chi uh, filter out things. But the question is, where do you filter? On the master side or on the slave side? Again, if you filter on the slave, it's possible the event could live in the relay log, but not actually execute. And I'll show you some, some of those in a moment. Master side filtering. Again, on the binary log, there are two parameters. Bin log do DB, bin log ignore DB. If you leave bin log do DB empty, which is the default, then it binary logs or logs in the binary log all changes to all databases. If you put any database name in there, it will only log changes for that list of databases. Similarly, if you say bin log ignore DB and it's blank, it will not ignore any DB. If you put any list in there, it will ignore all those, DB, all those databases. The reason why it's not recommended is because if you filter those, it's not being written to the binary log at all, ever gone in the case of ignore DB. In do, do DB, the opposite is true. It's logging everything for that list of databases and nothing for anything that's not in the list. What you should do instead is use slave side filtering. Yes, that means the events are still being transferred over the wire, still being read by the IO thread, still being written to the relay log. But we have these parameters. Replicate do DB, same as bin log DB. It's not, it's either going to write those to the relay log or it's not. Ignore DB, same thing. It's either going to ignore those written to the relay log, or if it's blank, it's not going to ignore anything. You could do it at table level, too. That's another interesting granularity here. So the point is, if you want to do filtering, do it on your slaves, not on the master. OK, any questions so far? I'm about to switch into some more heady stuff. Huh? OK, well, stop me anytime. Replication for high availability. This gets us some more advanced replication uh, scenarios. In a case of high availability, what you're after is you never want the app to go down, for example. You never want to have to take the app down in, in case anything bad happens to one of your servers. So the most simplest form is having two masters. So if you have two masters, you could write to either master, and eventually it'll get updated on the other master. How does it do that? Well, the master becomes a slave of the other master, and vice versa. 
So it forms the simplest of circular replication topologies. Therefore, you have two masters. It's not the same as multi-master. You may hear that phrase. Multi-master means that a slave can accept updates from one, more than one master. In the case of MySQL, it is true that slaves only ever accept up events from one and only one master. And it's still true in this scenario because the other master is simply a slave of the first master and vice versa. Again, log slave updates. You need that in order to be able to forward the things on later. So that means your client or your slave would be a slave of either the first master or the second master, but not both. Question? How does that handle auto increment? Auto increment is, is part of the events that are stored in the binary log. So is random numbers. So if you, if you do a query that, that has, generates a random number on the master, how do you know that it's the same random number on the slave? <laughs> Yeah. At the same time, they both get the same you could have a collision. You could, you, which in that case, you would intentionally set up the uh, auto increment to be different on each one. So odd even, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, there is, there is a way around that, a very safe way of doing that. Okay, dual masters. Again, master is also a slave. It sees its own events. How does it know events came from itself or the other master? Well, we have something called server ID, which is part of the configuration to set up replication. Each server has to have its own unique ID, and that's part of the event. It's stored in the event. So the master knows, this, you know, the, a, a server acting as a master knows where the event came from. And, well, it knows where it came from it or not. That's why uh, we avoid re-executing its own events. I'm surprised nobody asked me that. Okay. In circular replication, th this is another interesting scenario. In this case, you, you have many masters potentially involved. Each one is a master of the previous one. And I've actually seen a double ring here, but this is just a single ring. So it goes around clockwise. Each one has its unique ID. So if a write comes in on, say, master with server ID 1, and then later gets executed on master server ID 3, and it gets a write that there, it's not going to replay its own event. It's going to die or drop or fall off the vine, however you like to describe it, when it gets back around the ring. It's not necessarily a recommended setup, and it can be fairly complicated to maintain. The reason you might want to use circular replication is if you have, in this, let's say you have four applications that are all write intensive, but you want to be able to have the data available at any time you could split the writes up among those four. That means each master would have his own set of slaves. Now, the, the, I've seen that done before. But it, so it's, in short, it would be a specialized purpose to use the circular replication. OK, the, the guts and gore of binary logs. Uh, there are different kinds of logging. There's statement-based. There's row-based and there's mixed. Statement-based uses queries. The same SQL that your users issued is stored in the binary log along with additional metadata. Uh, they're log verbatim, but there are some exceptions. I don't recall exact examples, but in the manual, they list several queries that are not stored directly in, in it. Uh, I almost have one. I'll, I may think about it. Uh, there is some non-determinism involved. Um, it has to do with the context. So you know, use database, the, the command use database. Uh, if you have uh, queries intermixed, you got a use here and a use here, and they get mixed. You know, you could have the wrong database being the current database. So the moral of the story is always, 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 always beat your users into submission to use database.table <laughs> or database.object. Don't ever, ever, ever you know, use the whip. Uh, so that's one way to avoid that. Uh, it does provide compact, more compact logs, because it's not storing the entire binary row. Um, so statement-based logging is readable by humans. So you could actually print out the binary log, and except for the additional metadata, 
you would actually see the query statements. Row-based, on the other hand, was introduced in 5.1, is a more efficient way of executing the uh, events. And, and the reason why it's more efficient is because it stores the internal row format. So it has a before and after image for updates, or a new image for, for inserts. Which means when it gets to the slave and the SQL thread reads it from the relay log, it doesn't have to rerun the optimizer. It just applies it. Uh, it can handle those more difficult statements that SQL doesn't. Oh, there they are. Uh, user divine functions, UUID, that kind of thing. Uh, it allows for automatic switching. So whatever is best, if it happens to be a simple SQL statement, it could store it as, as statement based. So row is possible to store things as, as statement based. It can store partially executed uh, uh, statements. And it is required for MySQL cluster replication. So if you're interested in MySQL clustering, you want to do replication amongst different clusters. So MySQL cluster has its own internal replication. What I'm talking about is, the cluster, is replication between two separate MySQL clusters. You want row-based for that. So uh, statement, everything is replicated as a statement. And it's all available since uh, for something. But it's in 5.0. Mixed is a says use uh, use a statement based unless it's too complicated. <laughs> then use row format. So it switches row format for unsafe statements. So what's an example of an unsafe statement? Let's say you have a transaction that involves a MyISAM table. That's unsafe, isn't it? Because it's not part of the transaction. You can't undo it. Uh, so that's an example where I might use it. Row-based, uh, again, the, uh, the DML is replicated in row format, but the DDL is potentially in statement-based. So if you create a table, you may see that create table in the binary log, for example. But if you do an insert, you're going to see that as a binary uh, row. I mentioned the MySQL bin log tool. That is your primary tool for dealing with the binary log or relay log, depending on your needs. You can decode the events. You can look at them, and it will try to tell you all the metadata that's involved. It doesn't currently have make this human readable format possibility, but there have been some suggestions for adding that feature. Uh, you can use it for auditing, and most importantly, you can use it for recovery. So you can actually. Uh, so create a segment of the binary log to be replayed on your master or, or, or the relay log to play on your slave. You can decode by events, by position, or even date time. So you can tell it to dump all the events prior to a date and time, and it will show you all those events up to there. So if you know when somebody issued the, the horrible delete from with nowhere clause, then you can get everything prior to that. Here's what the MySQL bin log tool would look like when it's dumping a binary log. In this case, we are looking at statement-based. I can tell very quickly because I can read what the statement is. <laughs> if it were row-based, all you would see is binary data that you might be able to recognize some of the character data, character strings. The rest of it would be gibberish. Uh, in this case, we have some metadata. You see the start position there at 265. This actually tells you what. So if you're looking at the binary log to try to figure out when to recover from an event, it's right there, ready for you. It also tells you the event type. In this case, it's a query. If there was an error, that's also provided. And if it executed more than a few milliseconds, it would have some time in there as well. It even shows you the thread ID. Look at the set timestamp. Wonder why that's there. That's there because that table, I happen to know but because I know what that table is, it has a timestamp column. So you want the timestamp on the slave to be the same timestamp that was on the master, right? Well, that's how it does it. It actually sets the timestamp prior to executing that query. And the optimizer is smart enough to be able to pick that up and store it in that, that column for you. So things like auto increment, that's how that's stored as well. Okay. So, so the size of the event, then, is the end position which is not listed here, it's actually down further, minus the start position. Simple math there. Okay. 
Let's talk about MySQL utilities, things to make your life a little easier. I mentioned all these things like, oh, you got to use Change Master. Oh, you got to do Start. Oh, you got to do Show Slate. Oh, you got to remember the binary log. Ugh, there's got to be an easier way, right? Well, there is. The MySQL utilities, which is the team I lead, uh, is designed to automate a lot of those tasks for you, particularly replication for provisioning, setting up a master and slave, uh, testing it, monitoring to make sure that it's OK, or in the case when we, you'll see in a moment something called failover. You can do comparisons of databases. So if you have a table on one server and a table on another, you want to know what's different. I have a utility that will actually tell you what's different, the fact that it is different, either in structure, schema, or in data. And you can tell it to generate the changes. So it will generate the alter table statements for you. It will generate the insert updates and deletes to transform the data. Very powerful tool. You can do administrative tasks with users, connections, tables, and so on. There's even a utility to create a new instance of a running server. Why would you want to do that? Well, if you're in a cloud environment and you have a very large cloud instance and you want to spawn a new server, rather than having to copy the binary, figure out a new data directory, do all that stuff, install a new instance, whatever it is, uh -uh. use MySQL server clone, clone the existing server on that cloud instance as many times as you'd like. And now you have multiple instances running on it. Yes, sir? No, no. MySQL instance. Yeah. So what it does, uh, since you asked, it will execute a new process, new MySQL D process, and you have to tell it a new data directory. It will create a new data directory and run the install DB script. So it sets up a new one from scratch. Be very handy in, in scale out, like I just mentioned. Also handy for development and testing or experimentation. I use it as part of a, uh, I mean, I use it daily. I mean, I created uh, dozens of them running at one time. Uh, MySQL Utilities is written purely in Python. Anybody know, speak Python? Hey, guess what? You can download this. It's GPL. You want to create your own utilities from what it has? Say it's got a utility that's sort of what you want, but if it only had this feature, hey, have at it. Develop it. Have fun. Uh, it is available from Launchpad, but I did mention it's part of the, or if I didn't mention, MySQL Utilities is part of the MySQL Workbench GUI tool. So if you download MySQL Workbench, you will get MySQL Utilities. If you want MySQL Utilities without Workbench, you can get it from the Launchpad. And I've got a slide that shows you where to get that. And there's a couple references there you might want to start to read more about utilities. Let's go through a workflow for replication. And we have four stages, checking, actually doing the replication, showing the results or the status, and then failover. Um, so here's an example of checking. There's a utility called MySQL RPL Check. It's designed to make sure that an existing uh, relationship between a master and a slave is not only viable, but is without errors. Why would that be important? Well, if you have a large topology with many masters and thousands of slaves, at any one point in time, if somebody asks you, what's the master for that slave? And you say, well, I think it's this one. Well, that one's down. What was this master before it went down? You know, it's hard drive crashed. Well, I, I don't know, the hard drive's crashed. Well, you could start it up. If you have any kind of way of retrieving any of that information, you could run REPL check, and it will tell you whether that particular master is the right one or not. So it checks things like the binary log is enabled on the master, a lot of sanity checks there. Believe it or not, there are different ways of setting up replication some of which aren't altogether necessarily good practices. <laughs> this implements the best practices and checks it for you. So here's an example of it running. In this case, it's doing all these tests, and in this example, everything passed. Um, all utilities are written with a verbosity mode. So if you need to find more information, you simply provide the parameter dash dash verbosity, or simply dash VVV. I'll give you a shortcut. You can and it, that says verbosity, verbosity, verbosity. <laughs> I'm giving all the information. And if you ran it with this one, it would show you, for example, the master's log and position, the slave status, 
uh, additional information, the information it used to determine whether it was a pass or fail. All utilities are written that way. Okay, the replicate utility is the one we use to actually set up replication between a master and a slave. It simplifies everything because all you have to do is tell it the master, what you want to be the master, and what you want to be the slave. And uh, although it has a default, the replication user, the user to, to use to create on the master to allow replication. That's it. Very fast, very quick, and here's an example of it running. Doesn't do a whole lot, you say. Well, turn Verosity on, you'll see it does actually a whole lot. It does all the steps for you. There's no change master in that list. You just give it the mas name of the master and the name of the slave. Have at it. Woohoo! Of course, there are other options you can use, like I was mentioning before, about where to start the binary log, you know, reading of the binary log. We had a particular log in position from the beginning or from current. Default is from current position. This is a neat one. MySQL RPL show. I created it because somebody asked me to do it, and I thought, oh, this would be a utility that would be kind of handy, but I'm not sure anybody necessarily wants it. It's one of our most top sellers, you might say. <laughs> Everybody loves it. What it does is you give it the name of a master, and it'll tell you all the slaves. Again, if you have hundreds of servers to deal with, you may not necessarily know how many slaves are connected to any one master, because it's not a quick way of finding out. You could do show process list and start counting the connections, but there's, it's possible for a client to kind of sort of look like a slave. Uh, and there are other tools that can connect, like a binary API tool that you could connect, that which actually looks like a slave. The MySQL proxy can connect, which looks like a slave, but is not really a slave. And as long as you give it the topmost master, it will, it will, and tell it to recurse, it will find all of the servers in your topology. So in this case, this example shows the master at 3306 has two slaves. One of those slaves is a master to yet another slave. So that's why it says slave plus master there. And the reason why this is popular is because people will go out and make changes to their replication topology, add new slaves, drop old slaves, and then say, hmm, I wonder what it looks like. And they run this very quick, and it shows them what they need to know. The way this works, is that each slave has to be started with report host, so you give it the host name, and report port, give it the port name. There's no other way to dis discover the slaves if, uh, any other way except through that. So what that means is those parameters are used when the slave connects to the master, says, hi, I'm a slave, start sending me your events. It says, here's my host name, here's my port, and the master records it. You can see that information raw if you issue the command show slave host. So now I'm giving you the secret of how this works. That's all it does, show slave host. And then it converts it to a graph. So gee whiz, right? But it's one of those time-saving things. Now let's look at failover. There's a reference to GTID here, Global Transaction Identifiers. Every event in MySQL 5.5 and before, every event had uh, um, associated with it a, a binary log in position. When uh, an event gets propagated to the slaves, all that information is stored. But what happens if some events go from the master to some slaves, and yet other events go from that same master to other slaves, and the master goes away? How do you know what events were executed on a particular slave and not another. You can look at the master's log and position it will give you a general idea of whether you know, a particular slave is ahead or behind the master and which one is necessarily ahead or behind the other. But it won't tell you whether all the events got executed on a particular slave or not. Global transaction identifier simply appends a GUID, so 128-bit unique identifier to each event. Now we don't have to remember anything about binary log names or positions because each event is unique on the topology. It also means we don't have to worry necessarily whether some uh, events get executed on a particular slave or not on another slave because you, through this failover uh, tool, uh, it allows you to take, and if a master goes offline, it takes a slave 
and makes that slave a slave of every other slave, thereby accumulating all the global transaction identifiers that are unique. So do you have my global identifier? You do? Okay. Do you have, oh, you don't have that. Okay, give me that. You know, and it acquires all the, all the events and therefore becomes the replacement slave. So in a nutshell, MySQL failover utility was designed to monitor a master and if the master goes offline, execute that procedure I just told you about and automatically switch to a new master. Cool, eh? There are some pre and post failover scripts that you can execute to allow you to communicate with an application. So if your application wants, you want to use failover, uh, your application be aware of when the failover actually occurs. And the way that it works, yes, sir? No, what is that control? Right yeah. What's the name of the control? What's the yeah. yeah, 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 MySQL failover. In this case, I'm using discover slaves login. Remember I mentioned report host, report port, discover slaves? Well, that functionality is in MySQL failover too. You don't have to know all the slaves, just tell it to discover them if you use report host and report port. And in this case, by default, it shows you a health status of all your servers. MySQL failover works on master basis. So if you have multiple masters, say a tiered hierarchy kind of thing, you would run one instance of MySQL failover for each master it only does one master and it's slaves. Uh, it'll tell you whether global transaction IDs are on or not, and in this case, to be fully functional, it has to be on, uh, and whether the slave is, uh, or the server is up or not. If failover occurs, it will, it will actually start telling you what's going on, and it'll list all the steps that happen. Once it switches control to the new master, it then displays the health again with the new master as the root. Now, I should say that the, this happens on an interval, and it's adjustable. You can tell it how many seconds, hours, days, whatever, to wait to check the master. What it does is it says, OK, master, it attempts to issue a query, show databases. If that's successful, master's obviously up. If that's not successful, it says, OK, let me try connecting to it again. If it connects, master's up. If it can't connect, it says, OK, wait a minute, and then it pings it. If it can't ping it, can't connect to it, can't run a query, the master's dead. Then it runs failover. So that's how that works. The replication administration utility is an interesting one. It allows you to switch over or failover. Now the difference between switch over and failover is this. Switch over, you simply switch the role from the master to another slave. Master's still alive, which means you can tell the master to stop accepting writes or tell your application to stop writing to it. And that way you don't lose any transactions when you switch the role. Failover is the master is completely gone. You have no idea what happened to it. It's out in la la land, and now you need to get another master back online. So that's the difference between those two. And REPL admin will allow you to do either on demand. OK, here's an example of switchover running. One of the things you might want to know about is that uh, the demote master allows you to take the master, take it offline as a master, switch the role, bring it back up on as a slave. So if you simply want to rotate the role of master amongst servers, this tool will do that. OK, here's how you get it. Again, it's available on Launchpad. If you want to get it from Launchpad, you have to have the Python connector. That's also on Launchpad. Or you can get it directly as part of the MySQL workbench. And there are some URLs there as well. Okay. So in short, replication is flexible. Allows you to do scale out. It's asynchronous. You have a master and many slaves. It's an architectural building block for high availability solutions. Various use cases you can use it. Again, the various row formats you might want to use row, mixed, statement, and MySQL utilities can make your life easier. Any questions? We've got about 15 seconds. That doesn't mean don't ask me. That just means be quick about it. <laughs> yes, sir. Are the tools available for the community version? Are there? Are the tools? The utilities? The utilities. The utilities are GPL. They're separate from the server. But they are part of MySQL Workbench, which is also GPL and separate from the server. Okay. And they'll work with both community and? Oh, yes. Yes. The only caveat is the MySQL failover. And the failover in general requires the new 5.6 DMR to work. 
But eventually, you know, 5.6 will be released, and as you can see, utilities is ready for it. So. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, sometime soon. <laughs> we don't we don't have a, an actual hard release release date yet, uh, but it will probably come MySQL Connect, Oracle Open World. There'll be an announcement for it. So stay tuned. It's coming. Okay. Thanks. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago. We could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. 
the product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.